Well, hi, y'all. <laughs> this is a little overwhelming, but we're all going to be okay with it. Um, so like Leanna said, um, I'm going to be presenting a small portion of my dissertation. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Wonderful. Um, also, thank you all for coming. 10.30 on a Saturday, and this is quite the showing, so thank you all. Um, so, like Leanna said, my dissertation, it looks at uh, the two red light districts in Fort Worth and San Antonio. Um, I actually wrote my master's thesis on the Fort Worth red light district. Um, so this is going to be kind of a combination of those things. Now, um, before I get started, uh, one of the most important things um, that I deal with are sources. And so I want to talk a little bit about sources uh, because as a historian, yes, um, every claim that I make, I have to support from the historical record. Um, and so my historical focus, which is obviously prostitution, is, uh, it makes us a little bit difficult. Um, the, women, <laughs> the women who lived and worked in Fort Worth's red light district, which is known as Hell's Half Acre, and I'll be referring to it as the acre a lot in this talk, um, they didn't leave much behind in terms of records. Um, really, they left none of their own writings. So those who write about city founders and presidents and senators, they get these memoirs and letters and diaries. So I kind of have to be more creative about sources. And that's why I wanted to talk a little bit about them before I jump in. Um, so the first and most important that I've, that I've come across are newspapers. And newspapers are important because um, Fort Worth had several. So this is three examples. Fort Worth had the Democrat, the Gazette, the Record, and the Star-Telegram, as well as a lot of other little ones. And um, they would regularly print crime columns. They would report the daily arrests, the goings on of the criminal courts. Um, and they would also kind of publish articles recounting like salacious things that had happened in the red light district. And finally, they would report on um, the anger against the red light district, the reform movements against the red light district. So I have three examples of that. The first on the left, and I'm sure it's blurry for all of you, it's a very old newspaper. Um, it's just a general roundup. So at the very bottom, let's see if I can, ha, the very bottom, you see it says the keepers of sporting houses who were arrested on a charge of vagrancy. Those were madams. Um, there were lots of fun euphemisms for, the, for a house of prostitution. Sporting house was one of them. Um, <laughs> so this is, this is a good place to start. And this is where I did start my original research because you get names. Um, and sometimes those names changed, and sometimes those names were false, but it was still a really good place to start. Um, the second source that I've used is the census. Now, the census is really good because so once you've gotten those names from the newspapers, you need to make sure, okay, are they real names? If they are real names, where did they live? What, you know, where were they from? What were their ages? What were their races? Um, so this is where the census comes in handy. And I have the 1880 on the top and the 1900 on the bottom. So in the 1880 census, um, some women just listed their occupation. <laughs> they said, yeah, we're a prostitute. Um, now, a lot of times you would get them, again, using those fun euphemisms, border, dressmaker, actress. Um, but these women clearly said they were comfortable with it. They said, no, we're a prostitute. Or the census taker knew who they were and listed them as such. The bottom is more an example of getting a name and then cross-checking. So this very first name is Pearl Beebe. And I don't know if that's how you pronounce her last name. I'm going to go with it and say that's how you do it. Um, and Pearl Beebe pops up in the Gazette and in the Star-Telegram over and over again. And so in the 1900 census, as you can see, she's the head of household as a woman. <laughs> and then there are five younger single women working in her home. And as you see, it says border, right? So. Um, these were borders, and they list, sometimes they would list, like I said, they would list jobs. But I know that those five women are prostitutes, because I know that Pearl Beebe is a madam, thanks to the newspapers. Um, there are also really helpful municipal records. Um, so these are two examples of uh, criminal court case municipal records. On the left, you've got the mayor's docket. Um, so these would list the name of the person, uh, their crime, and then what their punishment was. On the right, we've got an actual indictment. Um, wonderfully enough, the Tarrant County uh, Clerk's Office has boxes and boxes and boxes of these criminal court cases. So I've essentially gone down once a week and just gone through about eight boxes um, to get these really valuable resources. Um, 
And then lastly are some miscellaneous sources. And obviously I'm not going through all my sources. We would be here and only talk about sources and that would be very boring. I'm just gonna go through a few. Um, city directories and the Sanborn fire insurance maps. So city directories like the census offer names and addresses. Um, and of course the census happens every 10 years. And sadly the 1890 census was burned so we don't have it anymore. So this is where the city directory comes in. It allows me to cross check those names and those addresses on the years where the census isn't falling. Um, and then the Sanborn fire insurance maps are another fantastic resource that I use a lot. Um, these were maps that were created to assess the likelihood of fire damage in urban areas. Um, they did them every few years. So there's, there's some in Fort Worth in the 1880s and in the 1890s and the early 1900s. What the great thing is is that they categorized each building. Um, now they didn't go right out and say, well this is a brothel, this is a body house. No, again, they used a euphemism. And this one says female boarding. So whenever you would see female boarding pop up, you knew, okay, this is a house of prostitution. Um, so all of these sources that I've mentioned, and a lot that I haven't, are what I'm gonna be using to tell my story today. So, we're gonna get started. Um, I'm gonna offer the briefest history of early Fort Worth. I'm very sure that there are many people in here who could probably talk about the history of Fort Worth in extreme detail. So I don't feel the need to beat that dead horse, so we're gonna go real quick. Um, June 6, 1849, Major Ripley S. Arnold establishes a camp on the bank of the Trinity. Eventually names it Camp Worth. In September of 1853, the army decides to move west and they leave this settlement to the settlers who had slowly started to move in. Okay. 20 years later, in 1873, Fort Worth is finally incorporated as a city. And the population and the, the, uh, the economy of Fort Worth uh, grow slowly in some, in some times and boom times in other. And they're built on the backs of cattle, the railroad, and eventually oil. So this is Fort Worth in uh, 1876. As you can see, it's not massive. There, there is a downtown. Um, and that little square is where the red light district would be. So in 1876, it's in its very beginnings. As you can see, there's not very many buildings. Um, and of course, this is going to change. So this is 10 years later. This is 1886. As you can see, Fort Worth has, has kind of exploded. Um, and again, there's that red light district. So in 10 years, the amount of buildings that have now popped up in that area show how much that red light district grew and how it's growing alongside the city of Fort Worth. And then finally, five years later, we've got 1891. It's even bigger. And again, that red light district, huge, um, full of houses of prostitution, full of saloons, gambling dens, all the kinds of things that you would want to find in a red light district. Um, <laughs> so now a successful and booming red light district requires plenty of customers and that's one thing that Fort Worth kind of always had. They were always ready to supply young or not young, single or not single, men <laughs> ready to patronize the many houses of prostitution. So in the 1860s and 1870s, you, the, the red light district starts on the backs of the cowboys. Okay? The cowboys on the cattle drives really get the red light district moving. Um, and then in the 1870s you get the railroad and all of the industry that brings. In the early 1900s, Fort Worth builds two packing houses. Again, employee, employing lots and lots of men who need something to do. Red Light District. And then finally in 1917, and I'm gonna talk a lot about this later on, soldiers, United States soldiers, um, which were by definition young single men who need something to do. Um, now, like I said, Hell's Half Acre really began in the 1870s. Um, there were a few women operating out of saloons or small little shacks, um, but as you see through these maps, expands dramatically over, the few, over those next few decades. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about, oh, no, wrong direction. Nope, go back. Sorry. Um, about what life would have been like in the acre. Um, so the acre stretched across four of the city's major streets, Main, Rusk, Calhoun, and Jones. Uh, Rusk is not on this map because Rusk turns into commerce. Um, it also ran from about 8th to 12th, although there were outliers, but that was kind of the, the core of the red light district. Um, and many of the brothels were clustered onto Rusk and Calhoun. Um, in the acre, prostitution took a variety of forms. It wasn't like there was one house and everybody went and that's what it was. No, there was lots of different ones um, and they broke down pretty significantly on class lines. 
Um, so high class, elite, you're gonna get parlor houses. Now, I apologize for the quality of these photos. These are the only existing photos that I know of, so if you've got uh, an in, let me know. These are the only existing photos of Hell's Half Acre. They were taken by a reformer um, and printed in his uh, reform publication, The Purity Journal. So they are rough, they are uh, grainy, but they're the only ones, and so I absolutely wanted to show you them. So parlor houses. These are going to be the nicest houses, they're going to employ the most attractive and the most skilled girls, and their customers are typically the, the cream of the crop in, in terms of men. They're the businessmen, they're the politicians, um, the high class men. Um, generally, uh, if we're looking nationwide, these kind of houses would charge about five or ten dollars for a date. Now, next are the middle class brothels. Um, now, these were generally referred to, so the high class were called parlor houses, because again, we love our euphemisms. The middle class brothels were, were referred to as brothels, body houses, boarding houses, they had a lot of, a lot of, again, of euphemisms to kind of show that they were, these were the middling, these were the kinds of houses where the men who patronized them, they sure had enough money that they didn't have to go to the dives, but they didn't quite have enough money to go to the parlor houses and spend that five or ten dollars for a date. Um, these prostitutes were generally a little bit older, uh, maybe a little less pretty, a little less skilled um, than those you could find in the parlor houses. And then finally, you have the lowest class. Um, now, what I'm referring to are these little houses right here. This is clearly a parlor house, it's massive. Um, but right here, these are called cribs. So cribs are one room shacks that were rented sometimes daily, sometimes weekly, um, where a prostitute would kind of uh, ply her trade in this one room shack. These were obviously the cheapest, generally 25 cents to 50 cents um, for a date. Um, and of course, the men who are patronizing this are the poorest. They're the working class, they're the poor men. Um, and these were generally your oldest, your ugliest, your most worn prostitutes, all right? Um, now, outside of the cribs, a constant in all of these houses are madams. Now, just like uh, I showed you those pictures of uh, the, the brothels, those are, like I said, those are the only existing pictures of any aspect of Hell's Half Acre. So I have madams from elsewhere to show you a rough approximation of what these women might have looked like. So on the far left, uh, this is Belle Breezing. She was an infamous madam in Lexington, Kentucky. Uh, very well connected with the horse racing. Um, and then on the, on the middle and the right, these are Texas madams. So Tilly Howard was an El Paso madam who had a huge brothel. And then next to that huge brothel, she had the mansion that she lived in. So clearly lots of money. Um, and then on the far right, and this picture that you might all recognize is Fanny Porter. Um, and Fanny Porter was an infamous madam in San Antonio. Uh, she ran a house of prostitution that uh, was connected with, and I believe it's Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. Um, so these are madams from elsewhere, but we can assume that the high class madams in Fort Worth resembled them in some way. Now, um, a prostitute simply defined sold her body and specifically the sexual acts that she could do with it for money. A madam, on the other hand, was a combination of landlord and employer. So they owned and they managed the houses of prostitution generally. Uh, they rented out rooms to prostitutes and they almost always took a share of the earnings that those prostitutes made. Um, Fort Worth had several of these madams and I'm gonna be talking about them specifically today. Um, especially the different types of power that they wielded within the acre. Um, this includes economic power, this includes political and civic influence, and then the power that they held within their own industry, within the sex trade. So, we're gonna start with economic. Uh, prostitution was clearly a lucrative business, um, and the madams of Hell's Half Acre were quite excellent businesswomen. Um, running a successful brothel required a lot of skills. Um, and a lot of those skills, madams would gain from experience. The majority of madams worked as prostitutes and then transitioned into becoming a madam. Um, they got their start by working as a prostitute in someone's, someone else's brothel, so they were able to see how those brothels functioned, um, a valuable experience they couldn't really get anywhere else. Um, so they acquired the tools of the trade and the best ways to deal with customers as a prostitute in someone else's brothel. Um, also, what was expected behavior in different classes of brothel? 
you're not going to receive the same treatment from your date in a parlor house as you would in a middle class brothel and especially compared to a crib. Um, in top tier houses, so the elite, the first houses I showed you, prostitutes were basically accomplished actresses. Uh, demonstrating at every instant their, uh, their date, their customers' uh, irresistibility. All right. um, they were able to flirt, have good conversation, dance. Uh, generally in these top tier houses, they uh, were very well behaved. So no body jokes, no cursing. Um, and so these prostitutes witnessed how the madams interacted with their customers, as well as with their employees. Um, I'm sure you can imagine a house like a, a brothel, a house of prostitution, was kind of a house of competition um, because you could have four to seven to 14 women living in one house, all trying to make a living from the same customer pool. So a madam had to be incredibly skilled at making sure everything was smooth, that that jealousy was tamped down, that everybody was friends for the most part. Um, they also were able to understand, working as prostitutes, the business side of the sex trade. Um, and finally, they would, could gain, if they were really good at what they did, a customer base, because a lot of times prostitutes would have their favorites, um, and a good income, which were both requirements if they wanted to start their own brothel. So I have a really good example. Um, Mildred Clifton, who was a well-known uh, Fort Worth madam and eventually a San Antonio madam, um, she got her start as a prostitute in Lizette Duval's brothel, which as you can see, is right here, it's nice and big. Um, and then eventually struck out on her own. So this is uh, the 1900 census. Mildred Clifton's at the top. It's a little bit blur. It's a little bit, um, I think, ink dropped on it, so you can't really see it. But as you can see, there's young single girls working in that house. So clearly she had transitioned from being a prostitute in someone else's brothel to running her own. Um, and one of the most important things, if you wanted to open a brothel, money was required especially a top tier brothel like the ones I showed you. Um, you needed to be able to build, buy, or rent a house. Often they would have them remodeled, um, furnished, stocked with alcohol, staffed with servants, and then obviously they had to have the workers, they had to have prostitutes. All of that required money. So, um, working as a prostitute allowed these women to get that money to then start off and on their own. Um, so, these again are pictures of someone else's brothel. Um, like I said, no existing that I know of photos of inside a house of prostitution. So, um, both of these women you saw earlier. So, the top is Tilly Howard's parlor. Um, and then the other two are Belle Breezing's. So, on the bottom you have um, her parlor and her brothel. And then this is a bedroom. So, this is where a woman would take her date to uh, do the things that they needed to do to, to make money. Um, and a really interesting fact, so I don't know if you can see this right here. This chair is made of longhorns. Um, Belle Breezing had, a, had an admirer from Texas, and so he sent her uh, furniture made of longhorns. Uh, and so that's what that is. I can show you closer if you want to see afterwards. Um, but clearly, these houses are gorgeous. You're not walking into a room and there's a bed, and you're just getting down to business. No, there's carpet, there's wallpaper, there's paintings on the wall, there's... Uh, drapes, there's flowers. So money was required if you wanted to be an elite madam, to be a, a high class madam. Um, so in order to, to do that, you had to have good entrepreneurial skills and you had to have business sense. Um, houses of prostitution, especially those in the acre, had a lot of moving parts. You were doing a lot of things. Um, generally, you had anywhere from four to 12 inmates. And that was the term used, inmate. Um, and all of, really, all of the newspapers, all of the contemporary accounts, if you worked in a brothel, you were an inmate of that brothel. Um, I'm not going to get into that, but that's an interesting uh, segue. Or, no, not a segue. Thank you. Thank you. Aside. Um, but anyways, so um, you had to have a lot of skills to do this. Um, so madams were checking on uh, their servants, making sure they're cooking dinner. They're making sure the sheets are being changed after every customer. They're making sure that the liquor stock is not depleting at all. Um, and they're making sure that if a drunken man broke a door down or crashed through a window, that those things are being fixed as soon as possible. So that's a lot of things. Um, they were also 
of course, because they are owning and running this brothel, they're in charge of hiring and firing and managing all of the staff. Um, and that includes the servants and the cooks and the piano players and the prostitutes, um, as well as being her own accountant. So balancing the income that she's getting with the, ex the expenditures. Um, and finally, she also had to advertise her wares, right? Um, even though this is a you know nudge, nudge, wink, wink kind of thing, you still had to let people know what's going on. Um, and I found an account of uh, one madam getting in trouble because she had sent one of her girls out to stand on the, the T&P uh, at the station. And they were like, no, you can't do that. There are respectable ladies and children getting off and they can't see this, you know, this trash. And so she got in trouble. Um, so you had to be subtle about it as well. Now, if all of this is done well, a brothel will be successful. And if the brothel is successful, the madam who owns it and runs it has the opportunity to become incredibly wealthy. Now, madams generally made money from two sources. The first was alcohol sales. Um, most brothels, especially the high class ones, would have a fully stocked bar. And the girls who worked, the women who worked in these brothels were generally encouraged to not get started on their date until their uh, customer had had a few drinks. And obviously, it's like a bar today. Everything is, is just much more expensive than it ever should be, right? So she's profiting from the sales of alcohol. And of course, she's profiting from her employees because she's taking room and board and she's taking a share of their income. Um, I, have, I've, I have several accounts where it's anywhere from 40 to 70% of their nightly or weekly intake. Um, and Multiple prostitutes live within each brothel. So in 1900, for example, right at the turn of the century, Mabel Thompson had four women in her brothel. Mary Porter, Pearl Beebe, and Mildred Clifton all had five. And Dolly Love um, had seven. So think about that. If they're working, even if they're only working four nights a week, you're getting a cut from all of that. So again, the money is there. Um, as, as, if you are good at your job, the money is there as a madam. Um, now, like I said, they didn't leave records behind. I don't have a diary where Mary Porter is saying, oh, well, today I took this much money from these four girls and it was wonderful. Um, so you have to make do. And so the two most important things that I've found are newspapers and probate records. Um, so newspapers would kind of talk about um, money in, in a veiled way. They wouldn't say, these women are so wealthy. Um, but so for example, in 1886, the Dallas Morning News tells us the story of Madame Brown an infamous Fort Worth madam, um, and it describes her as having an, an elegant brick mansion, um, and also talks about the fact that um, the Fort Worth courts would just raise her fines again and again just to see if she could pay them. So 100, 200, they finally got to 500. And when they got to 500, that she didn't have on hand, so she had to go and get it. Um, but so clearly means, clearly a lot of money. Um, it would also talk about the things that, that prostitute or that madams owned. So the same newspaper, the Dallas Morning News, discussed how two different madams, Mary Porter and Josie Belmont, owned silver place settings in their homes, in their brothels. Um, and silver place settings in a red light district seems kind of wonky, but that's how these, that's how these elite parlor houses worked. They, they wanted to present themselves as if they were an elegant mansion. Um, and of course, presentation matters. You can't get a city politician or the chief of police or a, a, a very wealthy businessman to patronize you if you look like a, a gas station bathroom, right? You can't do that. Um, and what's even more helpful than newspapers are probate records. And I really lucked out on these two. Um, so on the left, we have the probate records of Dolly, Love, Wilson, Ray. She got married a few times. Um, <laughs> And she, after she passed, she had her estate appraised. And it said it was appraised at $4,000. I think that's kind of on the low side. Um, but what is wonderful is that they went through and they appraised every item in her brothel. So I have three plus pages of, of every single thing that she owned. Um, so on this, we've got couches, chairs, mattresses. Uh, the other pages listed a refrigerator, uh, three kitchen tables, multiple carpets, and of course, diamond jewelry. Um, so again, $4,000 in, <laughs> she died in 1903. It's, it's a lot of money now. Um, but that's, that's nothing compared to Mary Porter, and that's what's on the right. So this is Mary Porter's probate court. 
Um, after she died, so she died in uh, the early 1900s as well, her estate was also appraised, and they appraised it at $18,000. But much of, that eight, much of that estate was real estate. She owned um, eight lots in downtown Fort Worth. So while her estate was appraised at $18,000, it sold for thirty-five. dollars um, And I've done the math, I've used the inflation calculator, uh, almost a million dollars in real estate um, for a woman at the turn of the century, which is kind of awesome. Um, so it's clear from the, the few things that I've been able to talk about, that owning and managing a brothel in the acre could be a lucrative, money-making business. And these women capitalized on every opportunity they had to continue to gain that income. Um, so s clearly, having sound business practices, being able to manage your business, was of paramount importance. Um, but they also needed to have political skills. They needed to be politically savvy if they were going to survive. Um, in the city of Fort Worth, prostitution has always been illegal. Um, when the city was incorporated in 1873, one of the first ordinances passed was uh, making the running of a disorderly house illegal and vagrancy, both of which are euphemisms for running a house of prostitution and working as a prostitute. Um, so those who took part in it um, had to do what they had to do to survive because obviously prostitution is happening. It's illegal, but it's happening. So what, what's going on here is they're forging relationships with city officials as a way of protecting themselves and their industry. Um, so the highest class of brothels, like I showed you, those two beautiful big parlor houses, um, they're catering to the upper class of men. So judges and city politicians and uh, wealthy businessmen. Um, and they understood, madams understood that if they were going to survive, they needed to have houses of um, privacy and discretion. Right? If it's not, if there's no discretion and, and people are just talking, oh, well, did you see so-and-so was, was my customer the other night? You're not going to survive. Um, so privacy and discretion were really important. And they understood if they presented a, a brothel that was very discreet and, and allowed them to do what they needed to do without it getting out, they also had a built-in level of protection. Um, and I have a lot of examples of protection that these madams are getting. Um, so on February 4th, 1896, that's what this letter is on the left, uh, police chief J.H. Maddox wrote a letter to the mayor and the city council. And the this letter was explaining why he had requested a dismissal of charges for a very famous madam, Mary Porter. He said that, well, Porter was charged with harboring uh, a prostitute who had been exiled from the city. And this was a really big deal because once you'd been exiled from the city, um, if you were caught, if someone was caught harboring you, they were in just as much trouble as you were. Um, Mary Porter hears these charges, contacts the police chief, and says, hey, I've heard about this. I'm innocent. Figure it out. <laughs> Come on. He does. He, he launches an investigation and discovers that she, she wasn't harboring this woman, this woman wasn't in her house, so all of the charges should be dropped, and requested that. Now, I don't know about you guys, but I sure don't have the police chief of Fort Worth on my speed dial. <laughs> um, and so she had the ability to contact the chief of police and say, this is all nonsense, figure it out. And he did. So clearly, she's got some clout in the city of Fort Worth. Um, in 1906, reformer J.T. Upchurch, who I, I showed you his pictures of the brothels, um, he journeyed through the acre for his reform publication because he needed to show the other reformers how terrible the, the acre was. And so in doing so, he's recording everything he's seeing. And um, one of the things he records is that there are uniformed police acting as security for several of the businesses in the acre. <laughs> so these would have been, these would have been saloons, uh, variety theaters, and obviously houses of prostitution. Um, so again, if you're able to get the police, who are supposed to be arresting you, to act as your security, you've got some clout. Um, and then finally, and this is on the right, uh, in 1910, Frank V. Lanham, who was running for mayor, um, one, of his, uh, one part of his platform was the corruption of the police. Um, and he actually specifically charged, and that's what, the, that's what this box is, he specifically charged um, the police with the fact that they routinely testified on the behalf of madams. So when they were arrested and charged with keeping a disorderly house, if it went to trial, if they didn't just plead out and pay their fine, 
policemen would come in and testify on their behalf. Again, that seems odd, but it shows the type of influence that these women had within the city. Um, and in fact, Mary Porter's funny because she clearly was kind of the queen bee of the acre. Um, she, while she had the police chief on call, um, she also, if she did get arrested, she would have a lot of times local businessmen, um, E.B. Daggett, I'm sure that name Daggett sounds familiar, um, W.H. Ward, who would pay her bond, bond her out. Um, so the political capital that these women have, a lot of it is stemming from the fact that they have money. Um, they used their economic power as a tool to maintain their political connections. And one way that they did this was through the fine system. So like I said, Fort Worth has prohibited prostitution, it is illegal, and yet it exists for over 40 years in, in the form of red light district. It still exists today, obviously. Um, and the way that they, they did that was um, through what we call a fines and fees system. So what would happen is there would be a regular kind of sweep through the acre by the police, whether it was monthly, sometimes it was quarterly, um, and they would arrest everybody, and they'd drop them at the court, and then they would pay their fine, and then they would be left to their business for the next month, or three months, or four months, or six months. Um, and madams generally paid between $100 and $200 regularly to continue plying their trade. These essentially acted as indirect operating licenses. Um, they weren't on the books, but everybody kind of knew what was going on. And I have so many letters to the editor in the Fort Worth newspapers from citizens going, we're not stupid. We get what you're doing, stop it. Which, of course, the city of Fort Worth didn't do. Um, and the economic benefits of the acre are what kept it in existence for so long. Um, like I said, it, it goes up to World War II, World War I, sorry, World War I, and we're gonna talk about that. Um, and it does so because the city is making money from it. And they're like, well, it's fine. It's in South Downtown. Who cares? It's fine. We're just going to ignore all these people who complain about it. And they did, for the most part. Um, so, madams have this economic power. They have this political uh, capital. Um, and what they also have is influence within their own social system, within their own industry. Um, within the acre, madams and prostitutes basically had to create their own social system. Um, they were, for the most part, isolated from the rest of Fort Worth. Uh, they weren't allowed to just be buddies with, uh, you know, a, a high-class society woman. Like, that, that was not allowed. They had to stay where they were. Um, and so in order to exist, they needed relationships and friendships, so they created their own society. Um, and in, within this, this society is a class structure, as most societies have. Um, and the status of a woman came from the house in which she worked. So the women who owned and managed and worked in the high class parlor houses got to sit at the top. They got to be the top of the hierarchy. Um, the ones in the middling establishments were obviously the middle class prostitutes. And then you had your cribs, uh, those in the cribs and the street walkers. And those are gonna be sitting at the bottom rungs of this social ladder. Um, and beyond just that simple class structure, there was also a clear class dichotomy um, among madams and prostitutes, right? Um, the main distinction between these two groups is clearly of employer and employee. Um, madams owned or at least managed brothels while prostitutes worked in them, obviously. Um, prostitutes could make money, especially in these parlor houses. They had the ability to create a lot of money uh, for themselves. But madams always had that upper hand because they had, of course, the profits from the liquor. And then they had the shares that they're taking from every single one of their employees. Um, so they far out earn the women in their business. Um, and another key factor in their, in their differing social status was career longevity. Um, now, if madams had a good customer base, if they had strong relationships with city officials, they could last for years. Uh, Mary Porter uh, worked as a madam in Fort Worth for 18 years. So you could, you could really stretch it out. Prostitutes' career, on the other hand, was really limited. And it, it was based for the most part, unless you could transition into becoming a madam, it was based on age and, and appearance, right? Once you start to age out, you get relegated to lower and lower brothels until you're a, working in a crib or as a street walker. So, madams maintain this higher position basically throughout the, the uh, existence of the acre because of, because of all the things that I've just said. Um, and the class dichotomy made relationships in the district, it was really interesting because they were really, really contentious and then they were really, really caring. 
Um, so it's a very contradictory relationship. Um, among madams, relationships among madams were among the most friendliest. Um, they saw each other as allies. They depended on each other for things. Um, and madams in Fort Worth, from what I've seen, weren't crazy competitive with each other. It's probably because there were plenty of customers to go around. Um, and they helped each other out, like I said, in a lot of ways. And one of the most common that I found is property transfer. Um, houses of prostitution, especially those parlor houses that I showed you, um, they're not constructed like regular brothels. I was actually lucky enough to find a blueprint of a brothel in San Antonio, and it shows how differently they are constructed. Um, more bedrooms, multiple lounges, sometimes multiple exits that you wouldn't have in a normal house. Um, and so when madams wanted to move to a new place maybe or retire, a lot of times other madams would get that house. Um, and I have a great example. So 1201 Rusk, which if you remember was back in that Lizette Duvall slide with Mildred Clifton, that big brothel, it d had this kind of path. So in the 1880s, it was Jesse Reeves' home. In the 1890s, Lizette Duvall ran it. And then in the 1900s, Pearl Beebe had it. So clearly, um, whether they're selling these houses or whether they're leasing them and then convincing the landlord, oh no, this is a good person, you should lease to them, there is this transfer of property through these women. Um, now, madams clearly had a good relationship with each other. Um, they relationship with prostitutes is a little murkier. Um, and that's because of that clear power imbalance between the madams and the prostitutes. Um, as employer and employee, they operated in an awkward space. Socially, they all ran in the same circles because again, they had to. They had no other recourse, right? Um, but prostitutes always understood how madams held the upper hand. Uh, they took their wages, they had power over their ability to work. Um, so the relationships between the two could be incredibly contentious. Um, and as, at the same time, interestingly enough, Madams were also caretakers for the women who lived in their brothels and in the acre. Um, now, one of the big reasons that this relationship is contentious is because of the exploitative nature of prostitution. Um, so like I said, madams are already taking a portion of their employees' wages, so from 40 to 70% in some um, sources. And they also, for the, most, for the most part, would charge room and board, right? So they're already getting money from this area. Now, a lot of madams, it was a common practice to set up a system of credit with their employees so that they could get uh, the clothing, the accoutrement they needed to do their job. Um, and they would pay these loans back on installment, of course, um, or with interest. Um, and a lot of times, the combination of the taking of the wages and the credit meant that these prostitutes would get into debt with their madams. Um, and sometimes they fell into such deep debt that madams would uh, seize their personal property. And a lot of times this was their trunk, and their trunk kind of had everything in it, right? Um, and they would seize this as payment. So by taking the personal property of their employees, um, madams were taking advantage of that power within the relationship um, to enrich themselves, especially if, those, uh, if they could use the possessing of the trunk to get even more money, or maybe even take the things that were in the trunk, jewelry, clothing. Um, and by taking the trunk, they also made it really, really difficult for the prostitutes to continue their job. Um, so clearly, there is an exploitive side to this relationship between prostitutes and madams. Um, but there's also a caretaking side. All right. Um, so sometimes they would wield their power in the sex trade for the benefit of others, whether it was their economic power, whether it's their political power, um, they would do it to help others out. And Pearl Beebe, who I've mentioned many times, um, she's a prime example of this. Uh, so this is her plot in Oakwood Cemetery. She moved to El Paso, she's not buried in this plot. Um, this is Mary Porter's headstone, which was just added uh, recently. It was, it was not there for the majority of the time that Mary Porter has been buried there. Um, but what's, what's also interesting about this is that there are two prostitutes buried in this plot. Uh, two prostitutes who uh, killed themselves. And Pearl Beebe took on that responsibility of burying them, of giving them a funeral, of interring them in her own plot. She also, um, oh, and those two women were not her employees. They were women in the acre. Um, so she really did that out of the kindness of her own heart. Um, and she also, there are other stories, so one of her employees, Laura Jackson, took her own life, 
and Pearl Beebe took in Laura Jackson's one-year-old child and cared for him. So clearly, we have a contradictory relationship. We have one full of contentiousness where they're taking money and they're maybe even seizing property. And then we have another one where they're taking care of the women um, that are living and working in the acre. Um, and especially with death, death seems to be this uniting force in the red light district. So when women died, so whether by their own hand or by someone else's, um, they kind of united to bury them, to give them a good funeral, um, acting as their surrogate family. Uh, so it's just one of the ways that, that the re studying red light districts is so interesting, um, seeing that these relationships play out. So the madams that I've been talking about, um, like I said, they're astute businesswomen, they've got political connections, um, they've got influence among their own social group. But as we all know where this is going, this way of life isn't going to last forever. An end is coming for Hell's Half Acre. Um, so as long, as long as the acre has existed, there has been criticism of it and pushes to, pushing to get it shut down. Um, so for example, I have a, a newspaper in 1877, the Fort Worth Democrat, saying, close them out, get rid of them, they're, they're no good. Um, so these are three examples from three different times. I've got a, an 1889, if you can see the headline, it says, it must go, right? Get rid of this thing. Um, now this, on the middle, is the cover of that uh, purity journal that J.T. Upchurch published when he went through the acre and, and uh, reported on all the salacious things happening. This is the cover. So as you can see, you know, the devil's about to pull Fort Worth into, into hell with him. Um, and then finally, on the far right in 1911, you see it says, pastors to start uh, cleanup Sunday. So you have different groups working to get rid of the acre. Um, and they're all, for the most part, pretty unsuccessful. Um, and they would cite all these reasons throughout the 19th and early 20th centuries. They would say, prostitution is immoral. They would say, they're spreading venereal disease. They would say, oh, it's white slavery. They're, they're kidnapping these women and enslaving them for sex. Um, and again, pretty unsuccessful. Uh, they actually, they would need some help. And the help came in the form of the Department of War. So in June 1917, the United States government selected Fort Worth to be the location of a new military base, which would eventually be named Camp Bowie. On August 22nd, 1917, Camp Bowie opened officially, and within months, over 20,000 soldiers were living and training there. And these are just two headlines from the Fort Worth record kind of explaining that. Um, now, as, as Camp Bowie is being built, as Camp Bowie is opening, as the soldiers are moving in, the acre is still in existence. Um, but the presence of the soldiers uh, are, gonna, are gonna bring an end to that. So, do, do, do. There we go. Um, so in 1917, Congress passes the Selective Service Act, which on the left, um, I know it's a little writing. Now the Selective Service Act's main purpose was to allow conscription to be used to raise an army. But at the very end of that document, there were two sections that dealt directly with vice around military bases. And this one right here is Section 13. Now Section 13 ordered the suppression and removal of brothels within a certain distance of military establishments. And it was up to the Secretary of War to decide that. Well, he picked five miles. He said, within five miles of any military establishment, there must be a white zone where there is no prostitution, there is no gambling, and there is no selling of liquor. So, if you can see on this handy dandy map, um, these circles, it might be hard to see, these circles represent miles. So. Hell's Half Acre is in downtown Fort Worth, which is right in the middle of the map. And two miles, a little over two miles out, there's Camp Bowie. So clearly within the five mile law. Um, and so the, the military officials in Fort Worth who in now, were now running Camp Bowie basically said, you gotta get rid of it. That thing's gotta go and it's gotta go now. And Fort Worth immediately acquiesced. They were like, yep, done, got it because they understood the financial gain that Camp Bowie offered. And so they said, well, we've, this thing's been a thorn in our side for decades. We've always got people complaining about it. And if this new camp is gonna bring in so much money, we don't need the money from the acre. Let's just get rid of it. That's the best of everybody's worlds, obviously, except for the women living and working in it. Um, so starting in late 1917, moving into 1918, Fort Worth's law enforcement combined with the military police um, worked to clear out the district by waging, quote, the most sweeping anti-vice crusade ever put into execution in Texas, end quote. According to the Fort Worth record, the city was essentially under martial law 
uh, without the official declaration, of course, um, with civil guarantees requiring warrants for arrest and for search and seizure um, were virtually suspended, right? Um, and men and women guilty of prostitution are arrested in massive numbers, um, more than 100 formal charges filed in the first few weeks of cleanup, okay? Um, in October 1918, after several months of the removal effort, city and military officials declare Fort Worth to be morally clean. <laughs> claiming that it was, quote, cleaner now than ever in its history, end quote. Um, even after the armistice in November 1918, the city trudged on with the cleanup, saying, quote, efforts of Fort Worth to keep the city free from vice have not been relaxed for one moment and will not be, end quote. So according to the city, according to the Department of War, uh, Fort Worth has rid itself of prostitution. Hooray! Um, there's no more red light district, which means there's no more prostitutes and madams, because that's how it works. Now, removal is obviously a process. So the city eradicates, Fort, uh, eradicates Hell's Half Acre. Yes, it's gone. They clean out all the women in the brothels. They shut down the mall. Um, but prostitution continues to exist in Fort Worth for many, many more years. Um, up until today, and these are just <laughs> and these are just three examples of of a few years after the war. So I have a criminal court case from 1921 where Louise Cantrell is charged with uh, prostitution, found guilty um, in 1921. Uh, Fifteen women arrested, charged, and fined for vagrancy. Which, if it's a woman being charged with vagrancy, <laughs> it's about a 98 percent chance that there's a prostitute. Uh, but 15 in 1921, and then the most interesting source that I've found is, and this was at the Fort Worth Library, I'm pretty sure, pages of arrests, pages of arrests of prostitutes in 1934. This is just August, but their names, uh, where they were arrested. So clearly, clearly prostitution has not gone away. It's just changed forms. Um, and this is really one of the biggest biggest uh, effects of the shutting down of the red light district. So prostitution continues, but clearly what's not continuing are the brothels and the madams running those brothels, right? That is all eradicated. So what the shutdown does is it forces prostitution to make a transition, and one that I would argue was not for the better. Uh, it moves from a brothel-based and almost female-controlled sex trade, right? If the majority of the prostitutes are working in brothels, and the majority of brothels are controlled by madams, again, you've got a female controlled sex trade. And what the removal of the acre causes is the shift from brothel based to street walking based. So street walking, as well as uh, phone dates, so they would, they would put their number and then they would call and make a date and then you would meet them somewhere. So not even, not as, not great either. Both of those are bad options. Um, and this type of prostitution is controlled by men, right? Uh, by pimps, by procurers, by, by the men who are protecting these women, right? So, <laughs> so um, while yes, there were bad things about Hell's Half Acre, um, the removal of it though, it, it didn't make life better for the women, which is what all the reformers said. They were like, if you just get rid of prostitution, they'll all start working in legitimate places and they'll all, uh, you know, find, ref uh, reform of their lives and it'll be great. And, and that doesn't happen because that's their job. That's what they know how to do best. They're going to continue working in that. So removing the acre doesn't make life better for these women. In fact, I would argue that it makes life worse. Um, it removes that social system and that safety net of a brothel, which could be terrible for women sometimes. But it's still, I would argue, the shutdown of the acre doesn't exactly help. Um, so Fort Worth may have patted itself on the back, and it did, for the removal of the acre. Um, but it made life more dangerous and more unsure for the women of Fort Worth sex trade. Thank you.